Hi everybody, welcome to a revision video looking at maximum prices as a form of government intervention. So what is a maximum price in a market? Well, maximum price is essentially a price ceiling. It's a legally imposed uh, ceiling on prices that suppliers cannot exceed. And typically a maximum price is introduced into a market to prevent prices from going above a certain level or threshold. And the key aim of a price control uh, as an intervention in the price mechanism is to improve affordability of a good or a service uh, to particularly to consumers or households of relatively low income. So a maximum price is best described as a price ceiling in the market. Loads of good examples, of course, many people think about rent controls. We'll talk about that in this video. Back in uh, the autumn of 2020, voters in Portland, Oregon, in the USA, voted to introduce a system of of rent controls. We also have, of course, energy price caps in the UK off GEM, sets a limit uh, about how much supplies can charge for each unit of gas and electricity in the UK. Uh, another example is claims management fees. Some customers uh, pay fees of more than 40% of the compensation they receive, but there's been a proposal that uh, claims management companies could not charge more than, let's say, 15 to 30%. And a really good example in the payday loans market, interest rates and fees on payday loans have been capped at 0.8% per day. And the total cost of the loan cannot be more than 100% of the original charge intervention there in the financial markets. And a really good example of maximum prices is in gambling. So the maximum stake uh, on, on each spin on a fixed odds betting terminal was cut from £100 to £2 when the government finally intervened in the market. Let's look at this example. Rent controls are always always used as examples of maximum prices. How strong is the case for capping, uh, holding down or uh, imposing a maximum price in the market for, for rented property in the UK? So let's assume that a government, city government perhaps, decides to introduce a cap on monthly housing rents. So how do we analyse the impact of a maximum price using supply and demand analysis? Well, here's our diagram. Don't forget to contextualise the axes, so the average housing rent on the y-axis and the quantity of rented housing on the x-axis. Left to its own devices, R1 would be the kind of average free market rent without any government intervention. Now then you then you ask a question, where must a maximum price be set to have any impact on the market? Well, of course, it must be set below the normal free market price. So there is your capped rent, your price ceiling. What will happen to demand for rented property if there is a cap imposed? Well, let's have a look. Well, demand is going to expand because uh, if the rent is lower, more people will be willing and able to, to, to buy rented property in that sense. But supply, if rent cap is imposed, well, supply may well contract. You see that the lower rent, R2 there, reduces the return to landlords. So describe <clears throat> the situation in the market if rents are capped at a low level. Well, um, at the capped rent R2 at the maximum price demand Q2 is greater than supply, leading to a market shortage. There's a disequilibrium and excess demand. Now, this is the classic critique of rent controls is that they lead to an excess demand in the market. So what might happen if there's a shortage of rental property at this cap? Well, some people might, there's Q3 available for rent, demands Q2. Now, some people might be willing to pay a higher unofficial price above <clears throat> the official price cap to secure scarce rental property. So there could be the possibility of a shadow market or a black market rent of R3, because if you draw up to the demand curve, that's what some people would be willing to pay to secure for themselves a rental property. Will a rent cap be effective in improving housing affordability in our major towns and cities? Well, in terms of arguments in favour of rent controls, uh, one argument is that controls are needed to reduce the sort of supernormal profits of landlords who might be exploiting those in greatest needs. High rents, we've certainly seen in the UK, impede the geographical mobility of labour and therefore keep structural unemployment higher. So if we can bring rents down, that might improve the geographical mobility of labour. 
And high rents reduce people's effective disposable incomes. They have less money to spend on their shopping, their food, their fuel. And uh, this increases demands on the state welfare benefit system. On the other hand, uh, capping rents, holding rents down below the normal market level might result in landlords withdrawing investment, cutting investment in rental housing, leading to a diminished supply of private sector rented property. And also, if landlords are making less money, they might cut back on the, on the amount of money they spend maintaining properties. And this would reduce the overall quality of rented housing and uh, have a consequence for tenants. There could be dangers from damp, health consequences from damp, and danger from poorly maintained properties. And crucially, and this is something that we often do see when rent controls are introduced, some landlords may decide to demolish homes for rent or, and, and replace with new housing to buy. Uh, and this can drive property prices even higher, rental prices even higher, where affordability is already a major problem, especially for young people. So there's a diagram for rented property. Uh, and the crucial thing is that if you then get some landlords taking rented properties off the market, that can make the supply shortage worse at the capped rent level. Whenever you get a question on Governed intervention in markets, in this case maximum prices, always consider alternatives as part of the evaluation. So instead of rent, uh, imposing a rent cap, perhaps the government should be giving local authorities more latitude, more freedom to borrow money to build social house, houses, council houses. Or perhaps there should be tax relief, tax incentives when construction companies are building more new affordable homes on Brownfield sites. Brownfield site is a site that's already been developed could be an old warehouse or perhaps a shop or a car park and you build homes on those sites. Here's the data for the UK in 2022. Significant variation across the country in terms of average housing rents. London upwards of £2,000 per month on average. Newcastle below £700. So you might want to press the pause button here. Give me two criticisms of using rent controls as a way of improving housing affordability. Well, uh, one is that rent controls may have unintended consequences. So we've we talked about landlords converting rental properties to other uses. So that can make the supply shortage for rental housing even worse. And that would be a good example of government failure. And also something we've mentioned, it could lead to a deterioration, a worsening in the quality of rental housing. And that has external costs, the externalities, the impact on the health service, for example, of damp, poor housing, which worsens people's health and reduces productivity and economic activity. Give me two alternative government policies that might improve housing affordability. Well, lots of options. Uh, here are two. One will be to offer subsidies for things like self-build, modular housing and tax incentives to encourage co-living spaces. So it could be the case that you might try and change land use policies. You might be giving more grants for construction companies that want to convert property. And secondly, um, zero VAT on building materials. Take away VAT on some of the key costs of building houses and allow local councils to raise finance through the issue of bonds to expand the construction of new energy efficient social housing. So those are two important sort of alternative strategies uh, to improve affordability of housing rather than just impose a rent control. Let's think about uh, another good example of the maximum price, the energy price cap, brought in in 2019 by Ofgem, which is the, the industry regulator for the energy markets. Now, the price cap is based on the wholesale cost of gas and electricity. and Basically, it's designed, in theory, to protect consumers' um, uh, from high prices. Of course, what we saw in 21-22 was a huge surge in world energy prices. The wholesale price of gas in particular shot up and the energy price cap was actually suspended and replaced by a government set energy price guarantee. And you can see what happened here. This was the wholesale gas price and the energy price cap in blue there, the index price used in each price cap period. So what are two problems with the operation of the energy price cap and maximum price in the last few years. Well, holding down the price has actually created quite a few difficulties. One of which is that many smaller entrants into the energy market, a good example would be bulb energy, a lot of small 
new entrants collapsed because the wholesale price of energy went up well above the cap, as we've seen, and created rising losses. And these companies just simply didn't have the financial resources to be able to cope with that. And also, critically, the, the, there wasn't a cap on bills. It capped the charge per therm of energy, but it didn't cap the total bill. So if you had a large household, perhaps a large family, a young family, or perhaps you've got a family with big care needs, for example, so you've got a lot of electricity needs, keeping energy, keeping temperatures in the house fairly high. Because you hadn't capped the total bill, wasn't designed to do that, bills were way above the cap, and that led to a significant increase in fuel poverty. Now, up to April 2024, the cap has been suspended. It's been replaced by the energy price guarantee on consumer energy bills. Now, fuel poverty is where you spend at least 10% of your income on fuel, and it's a major issue in the UK. Give me two alternative policies to reduce fuel poverty in the UK. Well, perhaps you've got to think slightly longer term here. So one might be to give some subsidies to renewable energy suppliers to scale up production and provide a more cost efficient substitute to traditional oil and gas. And another focus could be government spending, maybe funding for home insulation, boiler replacement schemes, especially in areas with a high percentage of relatively poorer families. There we go. That was a quick look, look at maximum prices. In particular, we looked at rent controls. And we also spent a few minutes looking at the energy price guarantee. Thanks for joining in. Uh, stay safe, stay positive, stay curious and see you sometime soon.